His tale is one of soaring heights, devastating lows, and an unbreakable spirit that forever etched his name into the annals of hockey lore. This isn't just another sports biography. It's a wild ride through the life of a man who bent the rules, shattered the norms, and left the world breathless in his wake. He's charming, he's controversial, and he's unforgettable. Who are we talking about? You guessed it right, the only Derek Sanderson, aka Turk. Let's get started. Early Life Derek Sanderson was born on June 16, 1946, into a modest family in the picturesque city of Niagara Falls, Ontario. His father, Private Harold A. Sanderson, served in the Canadian Army while his mother, Caroline Hall Gillespie, in the remote town of Dysart in Scotland. From an early age, Sanderson was captivated by the charm of hockey. His enthusiasm for the game was kindled and nurtured in an unusual setting, a scaled-down version of an NHL rink, lovingly constructed and meticulously kept by his father. This frosty stage, extending over the backyards of two similar charming homes, was where Sanderson dedicated numerous hours to honing his skills. The vibrant echo of the puck hitting the stick, the chill of the winter breeze, and the joyous laughter of neighborhood children comprised the symphony of Sanderson's early stages in the game. Professional Career Sanderson began his hockey career in his hometown, playing junior hockey with the Niagara Falls Flyers, a team in the Ontario Hockey Association. Significant achievements marked his tenure with the Flyers, earned a place on the second All-Star team in the 1965-66 season, ascended to the first All-Star team in the 1966-67 season, and won the Eddie Powers Memorial Trophy as the OHA's top scorer, also in the same season. During the 1964-65 season, Sanderson played a crucial role in leading the Flyers to the Memorial Cup Finals, where they triumphed over the Edmonton Oil Kings in a decisive five-game series. After four successful years in the OHA, Sanderson advanced to the professional level. He signed with the Boston Bruins of the National Hockey League in the 1965-66 season and made his professional debut that same season, appearing in two games with the Bruins. In the same season, Sanderson also ventured into the Central Professional Hockey League, playing two games with the Oklahoma City Blazers and scoring one goal. After briefly playing for the Bruins during the previous two seasons, Sanderson secured his permanent place on the roster in the 1967-68 season. At just 21 years old, he scored 24 goals and 49 points across 71 games, and racked up 98 penalty minutes, thereby carving out a reputation as a tough guy within the league. As the season drew to a close, Sanderson received the Calder Memorial Trophy for Rookie of the Year, a distinction his teammate Orr had earned the year before. This consecutive achievement remains a unique feat in Bruins history. Although Sanderson had previously been an extraordinary scorer in junior hockey, his role within the Bruins was primarily as a third liner, flanked by right wing Ed Westfall and either Wayne Carlton or Don Marcotte on the left. Before long, Westfall and Sanderson became the league's most adept penalty-killing duo. Had the Frank J. Selk Trophy for the top defense forward been introduced during Sanderson's time with the Bruins, it debuted in the 1977-78 season, it is plausible that Sanderson could have been a multi-time recipient. Sanderson, alongside the Bruins, clinched consecutive East Division titles in the 1970-71 and 1971-72 seasons and claimed victory in the Stanley Cup in the 1971-72 against the New York Rangers, marking their second win in three seasons. Following their victorious series against the Rangers and a clean sweep of the Chicago Blackhawks in the 1969-70 playoffs, the Bruins encountered the St. Louis Blues in the Stanley Cup Finals. Not even a minute into overtime, Sanderson seized control of the puck behind the Blues' goal line. At that instant, defenseman Bobby Orr charged forward from the nearby blue line. A brief pass from Sanderson reached Orr, who unleashed a quick wrist shot that flew past goaltender Glenn Hall, securing the Bruins' first Stanley Cup in nearly three decades. In celebrating the league's 100th anniversary in 2017, fans dubbed this moment the Flying Goal and voted it the most significant in the league's history. This unforgettable event became a defining highlight in the careers of both Sanderson and Orr. 
Philadelphia Blazers 1972-1973. In the summer of 1972, Sanderson inked a deal that was, at the time, the most lucrative in professional sports history. He was signed by the Philadelphia Blazers from the nascent World Hockey Association to a five-year contract worth $2.65 million. This contract catapulted him to the status of the highest paid professional athlete globally at the time. As part of the agreement, Sanderson received $600,000 in cash, an offer the Bruins opted not to match, with the remainder of the sum to be dispersed over the following 10 years. However, misfortune struck on November 1st during a game in Cleveland when Sanderson suffered a back injury after slipping on a piece of paper on the rink. When he was ready to return weeks later, the team management surprisingly insisted on keeping him on the sidelines. Speculation was rife that the team management hoped this would encourage Sanderson to leave the team and forfeit his hefty contract. However, his contract was bought out for $800,000 following the season. Away from the professional career, let's look at Sanderson's life off the ice. Personal life and health. In April 1979, Sanderson wed Rhonda Report, former Playboy Bunny hailing from Chicago. The two were blessed with a child, but their son, Scott Leslie Sanderson, tragically died at birth on October 4, 1981, in Niagara Falls. As reported by Ellie Tesher in the Toronto Star on March 21, 1982, the couple separated soon after this heartbreaking event. Rhonda Sanderson's in-depth inquiries concerning their son's death triggered an investigation by the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario. Unfortunately, business-wise, Sanderson was still not doing so well. Investments that initially seemed promising gradually became financial sinkholes, draining the fortune he had amassed during his successful hockey career. His extravagant lifestyle, punctuated by a near-constant stream of parties and high living, had a detrimental impact on his personal and professional life. By the end of his career, Sanderson was found sleeping on a bench in Central Park, heavily intoxicated. Mark, a low point for the once distinguished athlete, who had become more familiar with hospital rooms than hockey rinks. The physical toll of his lifestyle was evident. He'd undergone 10 surgeries on his hips, fought off prostate cancer, and survived two heart attacks. His body was a testament to a life lived on the edge, both on the ice and off. In 1978, Sanderson's former teammate and friend Bobby Orr found him in dire straits in Chicago. Recognizing the severity of the situation, Orr admitted him to a local hospital. There, doctors disclosed the grim truth. Sanderson was battling alcoholism and drug addiction. His struggles now overshadowed his once flourishing career. His life, which had once been characterized by his dynamic performance on the ice and larger-than-life personality, was now dominated by his fight for sobriety. Despite his past accomplishments and fame, Sanderson's life had become a cautionary tale about the dangers of unchecked indulgence and poor decision-making. Despite the turbulence that marred his personal life and brought his hockey career to a premature end, Sanderson managed to bounce back and reinvent himself in sports broadcasting. He spent a decade with the New England Sports Network and WSBK-TV, lending his voice and insights as a play-by-play -play announcer alongside Fred Husick. To prevent other hockey players from going down the destructive path he had tread, Sanderson established the professionals group at State Street Global Advisors. Serving as the director of the sports group, he provided sound financial advice to athletes throughout the 1990s, helping them navigate the financial challenges often faced by professional sports people. In 2012, Sanderson took on the role of managing director of the sports group based in Boston. His team catered to the financial needs of athletes and affluent individuals. However, he's currently not listed on the company's website. Adding to his accomplishments, Sanderson published his second autobiography, Crossing the Line, the outrageous story of a hockey original, in October 2012, co-authored with Kevin Shea. His first autobiography, I've Got to Be Me, penned with Stan Fischler, had been published more than four decades earlier in 1970. Recognizing his significant contribution to the sport, the Sports Museum at TD Garden awarded Sanderson the Hockey Legacy Award in September 2013. Despite his trials, Sanderson continued contributing to the hockey world, demonstrating the resilience and spirit that had defined him on the ice. What memorable moment do you remember about Sanderson? Please let us know in the comments section. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on the post notification bell for more content.
Make sure to catch our other videos on the next screen, and until the next one, keep the ice cool.